Good evening, everybody. Thank you very, very, very much for being here tonight. I know it has been a very long conference for some of you who are attending the ESOF conference. Um, it's Friday night, so I hope uh, we're all here to have a good time, to enjoy ourselves. The topic tonight is physics. Please don't leave. We're, gonna, we're exactly here to show you that physics is actually relevant to every aspect of your lives. And for that, we have three distinguished speakers who are also speaking during the ESOF conference. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Professor um, Jean-Patrick uh, Conrad from Imperial College in London. The second speaker is uh, Sarah Tegami from the Max Planck Institute of Nuclear Physics. And the third speaker is uh, Frank Close from um, Oxford University. So um, our three eminent speakers will start by sharing some of the messages that uh, they will be giving uh, to some of the delegates at the ISOF conference so that you get a chance to know what it is that physicists do that is relevant to your day-to-day -day life. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to start uh, with um, uh, Professor Conrad. So if you could tell us a bit about what you will tell the delegates at the conference tomorrow. Um, we'd love to hear about it. Uh, it's all yours. Okay, I'll try and do that. Can you all hear me? Is, it, is the technology working? <laughs> okay. Um, hello. I, I'm a bit untypical, so I think um, you may find that uh, what I have to say is unusual for a physicist. But I'm actually bringing uh, 25 or so poets from all over Europe to come to the ESOF. So I should tell you a little bit about why I'm doing this and how it happened. Um, uh, so if I introduce myself, I was um, president of Euroscience uh, quite a, a long time ago when ESOF was started. In fact, um, I was a member of a group of seven people that met in a hotel in Bremen and first wrote down on a piece of paper the letters ESOF. Okay, so... Um, we began ESOF, and already at the first meeting, we were beginning to wonder uh, what, whether we should introduce the interface between science and... Thank you. Is that better? Is that better? Yeah. yeah. Jolly good. Let's, let's remove this contraption. Okay. It'll be more comfortable. Okay. So, um, as I was saying, it, we began to think about bringing... Um, you want to take it all off? Jolly good. Do that. I'll feel much better. <laughs> anyway, the, we began to wonder about the connection between science and art. Now, it so happens that um, for many years I've been a practicing poet for longer, in fact, than I have been a physicist because I think I started somewhere around about the age of seven, you see. So... Um, I was interested in the question whether one could bring science and poetry together, and at first I was extremely cautious about this, as I thought it might not work. But in Munich, we were very lucky that, uh, this was ease of 2006, we were very lucky that we brought some poets and everybody thought that was interesting. So we did it again in Barcelona. We had the first meeting which was called Science uh, Meets Poetry. And then this worked so well that we produced a book from this. In fact, this is the only session of ESOF which produces a book at every ESOF. And so we did another one um, in Turin, which has just been published. By the way, I should say, the book which we produce in Barcelona, 3,000 copies, they've all gone. So we are going to have to make, I think, a second edition. And um, Turin we have just uh, published. And we hold usually the equivalent of a one-day meeting. So it's one full day where we bring poets who are themselves, in some cases, scientists, quite a number of scientist poets. And here we are running it. It won't be at the conference center, by the way. It will be at Trinity College, 
okay, in the physics department in the Schrodinger Lecture Theatre. And if you're going to Trinity College to attend this meeting tomorrow, remember that it takes about 20 minutes to walk from the entrance of Trinity to uh, uh, the physics department. So allow for that time. Uh, we um, start around about nine o'clock tomorrow, and we are not quite sure when we finish, um, but it will certainly last all day and into the evening. And we are bringing a lot of Irish poets along as well who are going to meet the... Okay. No, it's come back. It's come back. It's come back. So somebody, somebody did something. So anyway, um, so we have a lot of poets talking all day um, uh, tomorrow and uh, a number of interesting things which you might uh, uh, find worthy of your attention. For example, what is the origin of the ecological movement? Where did the ecological philosophy come from? Now, we have these stories that it arrived from America as a result of progress and that it is a recent thing. That's actually not true. The, ec the ecological movement, the ideas behind it, go back to the Romantic period, to the 19th century. You can trace them all the way back to the medieval theologians. So this is a very old question. And I think it is very interesting because it is the poets who have carried this idea through the centuries. And so this is one of our themes. It is to analyze where these ideas come from. And I think, in some sense, the poets have a better grasp of this history than the scientists. And it is probably interesting for the scientists to find out where these ideas really came from so that they have a better understanding of what they are up against. And on the other hand, there are poets who were in favor of science and who were writing the other way. So there is an interesting debate in poetry and something which the scientists must take an interest in. And so, so that's just one example, but please, yes. Yeah, I, I, my, because the, the theme tonight is around physics, so how much of the work being discussed tomorrow will turn around some physics topic? Well, um, we are going to have quite a lot of physicists there and one of them uh, is going to be talking, this is Ignacio, I Iggy McGovern, who is professor of physics at Trinity, and he's also a poet. He will be talking on the subject of the two Williams, okay? That is William Hamilton and William Wordsworth. And the, the interesting point there is that Hamilton, the physicist, was fascinated about the idea of becoming a poet. And Wordsworth was trying to persuade him not to. And Wordsworth was worried about progress in science, and Hamilton was in favor of progress in science. And there is this tremendous correspondence between the two, and Iggy McGovern, a physicist, will be analyzing this aspect of Hamilton's uh, personality. So that's as close as you can come, I think, to the birth of theoretical physics. Very exciting indeed, and I think this will inspire quite a few of our, our audience. So um, I'd like to, to move on uh, swiftly on to our second speaker, um, who has a connection, uh, we, who makes a connection between physics and health, and she will tell you all about it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank the, the organizer to invite me to speak to you about physics, and medical physics in particular. It's quite an unusual uh, place here to speak about physics. Closer, okay. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> it's quite a, I was telling, it, it's quite an unusual place here to talk about physics, and in particular, medicine and physics. Um, so tomorrow our session will be not only about uh, medical physics, but more in general about uh, light and antimatter topics. Um, so what is could you define antimatter? Because some of us don't really know what antimatter means. Okay, so um, probably a lot of you uh, read about angels and demons, the, the famous book of uh, Dan Brown, I guess. So he, here it was talking about uh, antimatter. So if we have some matter like a proton particle, a proton or a, a certain kind of particle we can have is anti-part 
which is this antiproton, for example. And when a proton and antiproton they meet, they annihilate. And what's coming from this annihilation process is an enormous amount of energy. I mean, nobody at CERN is using uh, antimatter as Dan Brown was suggesting in his book, hopefully. <laughs> but um, we are trying to understand if it is possible to use antimatter, especially uh, for some practical application like medical physics. Um, actually, my, um, I would like to tell a little bit about my uh, PhD project, which is basically in the end. So we did some um, measurements at CERN last month, actually, two weeks ago. Um, at CERN is, the, uh, CERN is the only place uh, in the world up to now able to produce antiprotons. So today I was speaking with a journalist and she was asking me the possibility to use antiproton in uh, medicine. And up to now, and she was asking me, how many years do you think it will be possible to use antiprotons in medicine? And well, if you think about the fact that it's the only, CERN is the only place able to produce them, it's quite uh, a futuristic vision, this one. Uh, but still, I mean, the concept is that um, a particle can enter, um, which is shooted uh, into a body, which, which has a, a tumor, for example, can produce some uh, energy in a correspondence of the tumor and can be able to destroy the tumor. And as you know, uh, cancer is one of the biggest problems. Uh, 12 million people are um, diagnosed with cancer each year, basically. And you don't have um, a real recipe to, to, to cure it. You can act with some uh, uh, chemotherapy, you can practice surgery, but one option is uh, radiotherapy. And up to now, radiotherapy used uh, conventional particles like photons or protons and a lot of uh, centers are growing up in Europe um, which are using other kind of particles like carbons. Okay, so can, tell, can you tell us a bit more about why we need to use these sort of different particles? What, what it is that makes them more interesting than the conventional way of treating people? Yeah, so with conventional, conventional radiotherapy you are efficient just beneath the skin because you, when you shoot a particle beam in a patient you deposit with photons, for example, a lot of energies very close to the surface. But what happens if you have a deep-seated tumor? You want to go something like 10 centimeters beyond the, the skin. It depends, of course, of the dimensions of the patient. But you, you consider 10 centimeters. Uh, and when with particle beams, proton or carbon beams, you are able to deliver a lot of energy, sparing all the earthy tissues which are in the entrance channel, which are before the tumor, and to concentrate all the energy in the volume of interest. Okay. So this you can vary, vary in the energy of your beam, but still you spare a lot of uh, anti tissues around, and you can plan your beam in such a way to destroy completely the tumor. Okay, so that, that's a fascinating topic and I believe there will be quite a few questions after we finish our introductions on, on this topic. So we'll, if you could keep your questions on hold for, for after the, the third speaker, we're going to swiftly move on to Frank Close, who will talk about uh, the flavor of the day, if I may say, because he will uh, uh, talk about what the, po the, the paper has been um, covering in terms of physics in the past week or so. So, Frank, if you could tell us a bit more about what you're, you'll be presenting tomorrow. Well, w I just realized what the link was between your two presentations. Dan Brown's Angels and Demons, there's certainly no physics and there's no poetry either. Do I now give my plug for my antimatter book, which was trying to explain what he should have done? But that's another story. But let's just play um, what Sarah was saying in reverse. You know, the protons and the antiprotons annihilate into energy. Play that film backwards, energy turning into matter and antimatter. That is what our best theories and experiments suggested happened immediately after the Big Bang. We have two big questions. One is, what happened to all the antimatter? And we don't know the answer to that. But given that there's something left, the second big question was, 
why do we have structure? Why is it that there's not just the debris rushing around all over the place at the speed of light, leaving goo? And the answer to that has been in the literature for 48 years, and as of last week, we now know that it was right. Uh, the Higgs boson, is there anybody here who hasn't heard of the Higgs boson? <laughs> it's possible that everybody's asleep. Hands up those who have heard of the Higgs boson. Right, fine. So I won't tell you here what it, how it does it. Um, you can ask me that if you want to. I can tell you what it does. And I was going to draw an analogy uh, with the problems of science as against poetry, but then <laughs> I was destroyed beforehand. But let's, let's go on. I, I, the analogy I wanted to draw was that if uh, James Joyce had changed a few lines in Finnegan's Wake, he would still have had a wonderful story to tell. But if Einstein had changed just a few symbols in the theory of relativity, the whole thing would have fallen apart. And that's the difference between science and literature. The problem is that Einstein's theory, when it was applied with quantum theory, beyond the simplest approximations, gave absolute nonsense. It kept giving answers like infinity. And that's why I called my book The Infinity Puzzle. Now, if you get infinity as an answer, it's telling you you haven't got a theory. There's something fundamentally wrong. But we knew how to get the answers right. If you pretended that everything had no mass at all, everything worked. Now, that's not a very good approximation to the real universe. This problem was solved in one particular case, the electromagnetic force. That's the force that we're not aware of it here in the room, but you get a compass needle out and it'll point to the North Pole. So with special instruments, you can tell there's this weird phenomenon field around. The electromagnetic force, how to get rid of the infinity, was solved in 1947. And a key element of that was that electromagnetic radiation, photons, have no mass at all. There is another force at work that leads to us being here. That's the force that's operating inside the sun and turning the hydrogen, the fuel of the sun, into helium, the next element in the periodic table, liberating energy. That's called the weak force. It's weak because it's very feeble. In fact, if you were a proton in the sun five billion years ago, there's still only a 50-50 chance that you would have bumped into something and turned into the next stage. That's how feeble the force is. It's feeble because the analog of the photon, a thing called the W boson, is very, very massive. If it wasn't massive, the sun would have burnt out almost immediately. So the fact that the W boson has a mass is critical to having allowed enough time to elapse for, for life to, to evolve. You might say, well, just put the W boson's mass into the equations. If you do, the whole structure falls apart. And then in 1964, Peter Higgs and several other people, in the space of a few weeks, independently discovered the way to do it. And of those people, only Peter Higgs drew one further comment, which is, how do you know whether this is just some mathematicians being clever as against how nature really does it? How do you know whether you've just written a, another James Joyce novel or the real one? And Higgs pointed out that there was a consequence, a new particle, which has been named after him, the Higgs boson, which if you could produce it in an experiment, it only lives for a fraction of a second and see what it decays into the way that it's produced and decay would be able to confirm whether this is how nature really does it or whether it was just a clever trick. And as of last week, it looks pretty certain that this has now shown this is how nature actually does it. So the final comment, there was a very nice review of the Infinity Puzzle in The Economist, which ended up uh, saying that although I gave no advice to the Nobel Committee as to how they should award their prizes, they could do far worse than read what I'd written before making the decision. <laughs> which put me on a bit of a spot because as of last week, the publishers now want me to write a 5,000-word postscript for when some second editions come out, including my opinion on where the prize should go. And uh, if you give me enough money, I'll suggest it's you. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I'd like to pick up on one point of detail you mentioned here, the fact that uh, we know, we're pretty certain that we know that the Higgs boson exists. 
Um, what do you mean by pretty certain? Because this is a concept that uh, uh, you know you don't encounter so much in everyday life. You know, either um, something exists or it doesn't, but we're not pretty certain that something exists. Uh, you know, so c can you tell us a bit more about this this concept of right. uh, pretty certain? Well, th the way these experiments are done, I drew an analogy. Um, it's like having two dice and you're throwing the dice and trying to see if they come up sixes every time. If you keep getting sixes, you know there's something special about the dice. If they only come up two sixes once every 36 times, you know it's just chance. So you do the experiments over and over again, trying to see if the sixes keep coming up. It's not as easy as that, however. The analogy probably better is that you keep opening a box and there's a demon inside there who's tossing the dice sometimes. Most of the time, you find the demon is tossing coins or playing poker or doing other games of chance of interest to everybody else but not you. So it's very hard to get enough examples of the demon playing the game for you to be certain. We are now, I think, pretty certain that we've caught the demon at it. The only question to my mind is whether what we have found is precisely the thing that these people talked about 48 years ago or whether there are some things not quite as we might have anticipated. And if not, that would be very exciting because this could be the first hint of, of further things. To, to finalise the analogy, we have been operating for the last several years under the belief, like Columbus, that somebody told us that North America was out there. And we set out from Ireland all the way across the Atlantic. Well, we, we set out. We've now found North America. What we're really trying to do is to find the gold fields of California. And what we don't know is whether we've landed on the West Coast or the East Coast. If we've landed on the West Coast, we'll have all the answers very, very soon. If we've landed on the East Coast, there's a long haul. That's where we currently are. So you might need to read some poetry along the way. <laughs> yes, but, but not Dan Brown. <laughs> Of course not. <laughs> so I, I think this was a very nice introduction to how physics potentially can affect uh, our lives. And I, I'd like to start by uh, taking some questions from the audience, if, if there is any. Uh, one there. <laughs> uh, hang on. Uh, were you at CERN when they were doing the experiment, or did you attend the conference afterwards? Um, I, I'm a theoretical physicist, so I don't actually do experiments at CERN. Um, but what was more interesting for me personally was that the week before that, I was at a summer school in Sicily with Peter Higgs. And contrary to what you all read in the media, we didn't know what was going to happen. Um, we guessed that something interesting was going to happen because um, one of the experimentalists who we approached said that... He couldn't tell us, but he was pretty sure they would be able to make a definite statement one way or the other. <laughs> now, as you can never prove a negative in science, that seemed to be a pretty good steer that they were going to say something positive. <laughs> um, and then about three days beforehand, uh, finally, uh, a message came from CERN that uh, they thought it might... that if Peter didn't come, he might be disappointed. But until the actual presentation was made, I mean, there were two independent... Ex two independent experiments here, and it's critical to understand how science operates, that science operates on independent verification. So these two experiments were completely firewalled apart from each other, and until we had seen the results of both of them and seen that they showed the same thing, nobody could be certain. And until that last presentation, apart from the DG himself, nobody had seen both experimental results. So until 4th of July, nobody really knew the answer. Great. So, another question? Uh, as Sabine said, this is kind of the flavor of the day, so excuse me if I just follow up on what you just said, Frank. You said it would be very exciting if what has been found is not exactly what was predicted in the, the model. So, very exciting in what sense? That we might have a quasi-Higgs boson and that we still have to continue the hunt for the Higgs boson, or that actually the model has to be tweaked? Um, thankfully, I, I think it, it's actually neither of those. Uh, I, I have no doubt that we have found a Higgs boson. Whether there is only one to be found and that's it, or whether this is the first of a whole family of things is the question. That was my analogy of, have we landed on the West Coast so we're very near the goldfield, or have we 
land on the East Coast, and there's a lot of interesting things we're going to find to get to the goldfield. Why is it that there may be a little question? If you look at... The, the particle's been produced, and it decays into various things. If you look in fine detail, it decays into these things not quite precisely balanced, slightly unbalanced. The likelihood is because the amounts of throws of the dice that have been taken so far are not enough to tell you whether it's just chance or not. But there are theoretical reasons to think that there may be other things out there to find, things called supersymmetry, to give them a name, and that these things, although you have not yet produced them in the experiments directly, could affect the properties of this Higgs boson in its brief mayfly moment of existence. So that it tips the way it ends up decaying slightly. So if this is a real... Um, by the end of this year, we will know whether it evens out and is boring, in quotes, or whether there is a definite difference between these two different ways it decays. And if there is a definite difference, it says this is the first hint of the gold fields from afar, if you like. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'd like to just uh, step in. I mean, th there's obviously a very strong element of creativity in uh, being able to dream up that Higgs boson when Peter Higgs first dreamt it. And I'd like to make an analogy with uh, the work that poets do, because poets are traditionally recognized as creative people, but I I'm not so sure that scientists are always recognized for their creativity. And I, I just wanted to, to ask you, Jean-Patrick, how you actually reconcile uh, the creative aspect of science with the creative aspect of poetry. Well, um, maybe the best way to approach that is to take uh, an example. Um, and the example I would suggest to you is um, the Persian poet uh, Omar Khayyam, who, as you know, is also a mathematician. And he introduced uh, into mathematics the concept of the unknown. <laughs> in fact, he wrote, he wrote the first treatise in algebra in which this concept was represented by a letter. And the letter he used is a Persian letter which resembles the letter X. And that is why we still use the letter X to represent the unknown today. Um, I put it to you that there is something rather interesting about this idea that a, that a poet should have introduced the unknown. Uh, and that that is a piece of science he was doing. So that is an example, I think, of being creative. In fact, being creative across the disciplines. Great, that's a great example. Um, anyone else's question on, on this particular topic? Yes? Could I ask pr Professor Close, um, it, it's possible to say that the pre-Socratic philosophers came up with the idea of the Higgs boson. Um, some Buddhist philosophers may say exactly the same thing. We're here, the world isn't falling apart. Just, I suppose, for a layman, I'm a scientist, but a social scientist, what's the point of proving that it exists? Because obviously the world is not falling apart. Is it a God particle? Is that important? Sorry, did you say, is it a God particle? Definitely not. Um, if Peter Higgs were here, he would scream at that <laughs> phrase. I mean, even people who believe in God would admit that it's got nothing whatsoever to do with, <laughs> with God, and those who don't <laughs> also. Um, the, the, your question, I mean, is a, a profound one. Why do we do science? It's basically what you're asking. And I would say it is an extension of what all cultures have asked. We all want to understand the great paradox of where did it all come from? and all cultures have got theories about their origins. And I suppose what distinguishes the present era is that we have the scientific method that can attempt to answer these questions. And this is the latest, and it's the end of a particular chapter in, in that. Um, a question which is hanging behind this often is, what use is this to me? Um, discovering the Higgs boson itself is not likely to have any effect whatsoever. On, uh, on you or me in a daily economic sense. However, to touch uh, base with what Sarah has been saying, that the 20 years that it has taken to get from building the machine and the detectors and everything else that have enabled us to find this thing has pushed the frontiers of science and technology in many different places, not least 
that developments in detectors are now being used in hospitals and airport scanners and so forth. I think that's, that's fair, is it? That um, there are techniques now being applied elsewhere that were invented by CERN or scientists working on the CERN experiments over the last 20 years in order to achieve their particular, particular goal. I mean, the World Wide Web is now becoming cliched, but nonetheless, it is true that that was one of the things that was uh, created along the way. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Yeah, one here. Hi, I have a question for Sarah um, about what creative leap did it take you to go from medical physics to start applying, you know, anti-protons? Like, wh where did that come from? So the link between particle therapy and anti-protons. How did just how did that come to your mind that we should go from just regular particle therapy to anti-particle therapy? Like, what sort of what brought you there? So it didn't come into my mind actually. <laughs> The idea of using antiprotons is that they are particles like protons, like uh, carbons, and of course they behave like particles. Um, the antiprotons, they are able, when they annihilate, to deposit an additional amount of energy. And so this is very important when you want to be efficient at a certain precise point. The nice thing of antiproton is that in the entrance channel in the uh, before before in, in the earthy tissues you are able to deposit very less energy and you can be much more effective in the tumor volume um, we can say that they behave like carbon in the peak in the hot point and we, they behave like mm, protons in the uh, not important point so it's something in the middle the this use of antiparticles in therapy, I find, is a, an example, to, to come back to your question. 1928, Paul Dirac, a mathematician, was trying to understand how to combine the theory of relativity with quantum mechanics. Two pretty arcane ideas, and he found he could only do it if the electron didn't exist alone. There was what we now call the antiparticle version of it, the positron. And positron emission tomography is saving lives here today, and antiprotons now are being applied. So the idea that by scribbling equations on a piece of paper, they tell you something about nature, that there's antimatter out there, and then years later people are using that stuff to save lives, you, you couldn't predict it. Well, he did, <laughs> but uh, you know what I mean. Thank you. Um, so I, I have one more question, actually, because uh, while, while we're on the topic of uh, particles uh, used for, for um, nuclear uh, medicine, um, I'd like to know a bit more about the uh, borders of, of this field and uh, which, are the, what is, which is the current research that's ongoing that pushes the limit of, of that science? You know, where are we heading to? Which are the, the key topical area of that science that we haven't resolved yet? Wow, <laughs> that's a very complex question because um, it's a very complex topic. So um, the, the difficult things of particle therapy is that in this field, physics meets medicine and biology. So it's like an explosive mixture. So not everything can be explained using only physics, but also not everything can be explained using only biology. So people are trying to understand better biology, to improve physics, to help biology as much as possible, and to mix it with medicine. So to, do, to, to, to be able to, um, to do this, we have to have a lot of knowledge about uh, medicine, about what is needed to destroy one tumor, how are the tissue responding to radiation, and how can we uh, provide efficient radiation? So what is the better radiation that we have to, um, to, to give to medicine? Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of research now going on in the hadron therapy. So I was speaking about carbon beams, but there are a lot of studying also on oxygen beam, helium beams, because depending on the particle that you are choosing, you can have different response on the tissues. You can be more efficient or less efficient depending on the mm, tissue type and the end point uh, that you want to reach. Right, okay, so, so there's still plenty to explore and... Uh yes, and also um, on the way you want to um, 
treat the patients, on the positioning of the patient, of the opi optimization of the treatments. I mean, there's a lot of research still going on. So we wouldn't want to raise um, everyone's hope in the room. I mean, th this is work in progress. There's, there's been yes, some definitely. interesting results at this point. Uh, I mean, th can we say that there has been some... Um, do, you, do you have some figures concerning how, how much um, improvement can be made using these sort of therapies as opposed to standard therapies in cancer? Do you, do you have example of how much time you can buy, uh, literally? Yeah, I mean... Like um, Usually when you treat cancer, you, you don't go directly to radiotherapy. You try to, you can use surgery, you can use chemotherapy, and finally also radiotherapy. And usually you make a mixture. Like when you remove a tumor with a surgical operation, you, see, you, you have not finished with your work. You have still to take care of all the metastases that may be uh, around the body, and their chemotherapy can be useful. Or you, you want to be sure that you dis remove completely the tumor and then with the radiotherapy you can kind of clean all the surround part um, that you removed before. So usually it's, it's a combination of the, of the three approaches. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering, is there still a problem with the amount of antimatter that can be produced even at CERN? And is, is that holding back your research, sir? Both of you, uh, if you can answer. Yeah. Shall I start? <laughs> um, okay, so the amount of uh, antimatter produced is strictly connected with the available beam time. Because, um, as I said before, you you want to have antiproton of a certain kind of energy uh, because you, can, you, you want to have 100 uh, MeV of energy, approximately. And there is only one facility producing antiproton and a lot of experiments they want to take antiprotons. And each experiment wants to have a different energy. So the beam, of course, has to be prepared. The experiment has to be prepared. And all the community of antiprotons want to take advantage of the beam time. So there is a lot of fight to have beam time at CERN, actually. Um, we are doing um, uh, research with, uh, for, for medical physics, and we have available only 10 days per year. So during these 10 days, we, we work usually 24 hours, night, day, doesn't matter. But still, if you consider that 12, over 12 months, you can only have 10 days of research. It's is nothing. So we try to be efficient, but we do as much as we can. Right, thank you. Um. What, what, what was your question about, when you said the problems of antimatter, did you mean why, why has it all, all disappeared or are you just asking the applications question? Yeah, I, I thought there might be a problem with the amount that that may be holding back the research. And as, as Sarah has said, it seems that everybody wants to get their hands on this limited amount of beam time. But um, maybe, maybe with the Higgs having been more or less found, that that will help the amount of, of other research that will happen now at CERN. Or my, my question is, what now for CERN that, that the Higgs particle has more or less been found? Oh, I see, okay. Well, th that at least is an easier one to answer because although the Higgs particle had a huge amount of publicity, that was not the reason why the Large Hadron Collider was, was built. <laughs> but um, the, the Large Hadron Collider is able to create in the lab the sort of conditions that the universe experienced about a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. And that is an epoch where, according to theory at least, a lot of interesting things were taking place, one of which is that the universe was suddenly beginning to experience this Higgs field. That, at least, we have now verified. But there are questions like this. We, ha we now understand um, how it is that 4% of everything in the universe exists. 96% we haven't got a clue about. That's called dark matter. We know from the behavior of the galaxies that there's vast amount of stuff out there giving a gravitational tug, but it doesn't shine at all. And there is nothing at all in the menu of particles that we know of, even including the Higgs boson, that has the required properties to create dark matter. 
There are theories, however, around, of which supersymmetry is the one with the best pedigree, probably, which contain particles that may well be dark matter particles. The problem is that although we, I'm pretty sure these things exist, we don't know whether they are within the reach of the LHC or far beyond. That was a, really what my California versus, you know, my West Coast versus East Coast analogy was. That is why I was hoping, in answer to Brian's question, that when we look at the precise properties of the Higgs boson, we will see that they don't quite fit the naive expectation because the presence of these supersymmetric or dark particles or what have you are acting behind the scenes using the, the wonders of quantum theory. Sometimes you can see the dawn before it happens, that sort of phenomenon. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we, we keep coming back to that topic of unknown, the unknown, as, as you described it. Um, I, I'd like to ask you um, again um, a further question uh, regarding poetry and, and how poetry can exploit this concept of unknown to um, lead the imagination of the reader. I mean, um, do you have anything to, to say about that? Yeah, well, actually, I'd like to connect with what has just been said because um, it, it, uh, uh, you might be aware, and this was illustrated actually in uh, the Turin uh, Science Meets Poetry event. We had um, an astronomer and uh, poet, uh, Jean-Pierre Luminet, and Jean-Pierre is responsible for making one of these beautiful drawings of the what the black hole, how to imagine the black hole, and he was looking for a caption to this drawing, and nobody could think of a perfect caption, but then he realized that there is a French poet of the 19th century who had already described the black hole perfectly, and this is now used as the caption for this drawing. This is Gérard de Nerval, who wrote a poem which perfectly describes all the properties of the black hole, although Gérard de Nerval had no concept of the black hole whatsoever. But he put it in such a beautiful style and such a perfect poem, you might think that he had the black hole in front of him when he wrote the poem. It is quite astonishing. Um, I would say that uh, it is an example of the poet, if you like, thinking that such a thing much must exist. Of course, he could not prove it, or even imagine how it might be proved, but the idea was already there in a very interesting way, because he got to it through a totally different route. Um, and I think, actually, if you're a scientist and you are writing a grant application and you are really doing what they say you should do, which is to talk about something which you have not yet discovered, now, I suspect that 99% of grant applications are applications to do something which you know already, okay? But maybe there are 1% of people around who actually do say in their grant application, I'm going to try and look for something and I don't know if it yet exists. Well, if you're doing that, you're doing poetry, aren't you? Okay? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think there is one example, that, again, that to me shows where poetry and music can touch with science, and it's the experience of being a scientist. When July the 4th happened, and we knew that what we had suspected was, in fact, how nature really works, I had a sort of very strange sensation. And you read poetry sometimes, you know, like... Uh, Kubla Khan through Caverns Measureless to Man or some particular stanza of music in the middle of a Beethoven symphony and you get that feeling and that's the feeling that occasionally you get in science. As a scientist you can experience it and all I can say is you've had that feeling in other places. Thank you. <laughs> Any more questions? You don't need to be shy. Huh? We're amongst us. Yes. Over there at the back. Yeah, I've got a question for Sarah. Um, you know the way that you were talking about uh, the using antiparticles as a new way of treating cancer. Do you know the, um, what exactly, uh, how, how does that really work? Like we know that chemotherapy uh, targets uh, cancer and as a kind of a poison. What does the antiparticles actually do to the cancer cells? 
Yes. He was just saying he destroys it. <laughs> So um, you were asking about the comparison between chemotherapy and antiprotons. Wow. So um, with chemotherapy, you destroy everything, basically, right? You are not able to, um, to target your cure, your drugs, to the tumor, and spreading all the stuff around. So usually when you undergo radio, um, chemotherapy, you have a, a, a big effect on the whole body. And it is the big advantage of, of this uh, therapy. Uh, when you use particle, and you use it especially antiprot, in, in a very, very far future, you could use eventually antiprotons. Uh, the nice thing is that you can be effective only in, in the tumor, and so you don't touch all the healthy tissues. Of course, you have to keep into account that a little bit of radiation is going also in the healthy tissues. Um, usually what you do in therapy is to get not all the, um, all the energy in one spot, in one shot, but usually you, you undergo different uh, fractions of some minutes each day. And the, the whole therapy usually is, can, can be like 20 days long. So you have to go every day like for 20 times in a month and you get just a little bit of radiation. And the day after, just a little bit of radiation. And this allows your healthy tissues to recover because healthy tissues and tumor tissue, they respond differently to radiation. Um, the healthy tissue recover faster than tumor tissues. So you, you, you give them the possibility to rest a little bit and to undergo some DNA uh, repair mechanism. And in the meanwhile, the tumor doesn't repay so much. So the, the day after, you are much more efficient towards the tumor, and you provoke less damage, let's say, to the healthy tissues. So basically, it's all a matter of being efficient where you want to be efficient, and not destroy all the things. Thank you. I mean, this is really where the improvement is coming from in, in, in current therapies, that you're much more targeted in your approach. And you're even using 3D imaging, from what I understand, yes. to, to, to help it happen and, and being as targeted as can be. Actually, you mentioned imaging, and imaging is very important because you can be very efficient once you know exactly where your tumor is. And you can imagine what happens if you have something like a organ motions. So if you have like a tumor in your head, for example, you are fixed you don't move it too much. But you, if you're a tumor in your lung, when you're breathing, of course, everything is moving. And if you think about the peak of carbons, for example, you have one millimeter peak, and you're moving your bre breast, for example, of two centimeter, all your treatment plan can, can, goes, uh, can become inefficient. And so now there are a lot of research also in this topic, like trying to synchronize your radiation, your beam, with the your breathing cycle, for example, or um, teaching the patients how to breath and modulating the, the beam to the mm, rhythm. Yes, uh, which yeah, is, all, which all is extremely complex work and, and requires a lot of coordination and a lot of understanding of the patient and the physics at, at the same time, which, which comes back to the issue of multidisciplinary approach that you need to have in, in medical physics. And you've touched upon it by saying, yeah, it's biology combined with medicine combined with physics. And that's what makes it so complex. And that's what requires the intervention of different types of scientists to work together. And, and I think that's a the theme in today's science that's very much alive, that people need to collaborate in order to achieve uh, but results in modern science, and I think Frank, you might have something to say about that. Well, absolutely. I, I was seeing a program recently on it's really how computer science and engineering have combined together to enable you to do things in cancer therapy, which previously you couldn't. I mean, in the past, you might say send a hundred units into the patient in that direction. Now you send one unit from a hundred different directions, and there was this amazing machine moving around like this, computer controlled all the way through. And I thought, you know, that it's engineering that's really doing it. Mm -hmm. And what I wrote after the discovery on July the 4th, you know, everybody's heard about the Higgs boson now, a wonderful thing, but actually, this was a triumph for engineering. 
<laughs> 20 years ago, if you had asked me, will the Large Hadron Collider ever exist, I'd have said probably not. Uh -huh. The challenges that had to be overcome in a whole range of science and technology seem so huge that you would have probably bet that somewhere on the line it won't work. But actually, it did. And, and, and I think that's one of the things that's quite fascinating about the CERN laboratory is that when you do go uh, there, and, and it's actually open to the public to visit, they do um, uh, quite a lot of visits, you actually meet people from all walks of science. They're chemists, they're biologists, they're engineers, there's um, IT specialists, there's you know the whole spectrum. And of course, physicists, theoretical and applied, <laughs> by the way. Uh, and, and, and that's, that's one of the, the, the feet of modern science, pretty much. It's a huge, it's a huge cooperative venture. So, um, any more questions? You've all been won over. This is going to be your next um, topic of study. There's lots of popular science books on physics, and uh, this hopefully will will inspire you. So I think um, we, we're we're reaching the time when we need to close. And before I, c I close this discussion, I'd like to ask each of our speakers uh, whether they have a last comment uh, before we invite you all to have drinks and uh, nibble food. Um. About our topic. Just con concluding comment, if ah. you have any more to say. <laughs> um, well, I think that um, when people ask me um, if you would, if you have a tumor, what would you do first? Would you do chemotherapy or tumor therapy? And I would say that it depends. It depends a lot what what kind of disease you have, what kind of tumor you have, what kind of um, um, treatment, you, um, it's better for you as an individual and for the, for the kind of tumor you have. And also, it's very much important the, um, the place of your world you want to be cured in. For example, if you go to Japan, you will have a certain kind of approach. If you go to US, you will have an, a different kind of approach. For example, in US, they, they don't use any carbon beam, any proton, any uh, particle beam. They only use proton beam. So uh, I, I am from Heidelberg, and in Heidelberg, the um, heavy, heavy, heavy high-end community is very strong. So of course, uh, I was educated in this context, and I think that uh, the best is carbon, uh, carbon, carbon therapy. So I would say. Um, when people ask me uh, this kind of question, I, I never know what to say because uh, everybody should um, try to get a little bit involved and to try to ask the, um, uh, always to some the experts in this field. So I think the, the, this, this answer really uh, points it uh, very well. I mean, the, the issue of medical tourism is something that has been discussed in the media here. Um, I mean, the health system being the way it is, um, you know, people sometimes are wondering whether they should be better off uh, taking a plane, uh, you know, to, to have um, health care. Um, personally, I don't think it's the solution, but uh, that's a debate for another, another cafe. Uh, I will move on uh, to your closing comment. Maybe, Frank, if you have any more to add on to this. Um, all men of my age, go and have your PSA measured and... From personal experience, I can guarantee that the wonders of modern engineering combined with surgery can do wonderful things. <laughs> and with regards to the Higgs boson discovery, whether this is the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning, I think is the major question. That I think we have indeed closed the chapter, which began probably 100 years ago with the discovery of the atomic nucleus, which incidentally did not get anybody a Nobel Prize, contrary to what people think. Rutherford got the prize for um, transmutation of the elements, uh, not for the discovery of the atomic nucleus. So I think there have been some overhyped statements in the media by people who probably haven't been around long enough who have made statements like, this is the greatest discovery since over 100 years ago, shutting their eyes to the fact, I think the atomic nucleus has done more for good <laughs> as well as ill, um, and... Uh, along the way, but it is without doubt a very important moment in science. And I say with Peter Higgs, the comment that he made at CERN was that he was pleased to see that it, the idea was verified in his lifetime. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll um, give the last word to Brian Trench, um, and thank you very much.
Well, I just want to add my thanks uh, on behalf of the Irish Science and Technology Journalists Association to our, our speakers. Uh, but just wait, hold on a second. <laughs> um, I don't know how many people, how many people have been at a science cafe before? Oh, quite a few. And, and in other countries? Uh, yes, it includes Britain. <laughs> um, actually, the, the first science cafe that I uh, facilitated was in the canteen, one of the many canteens in CERN. Uh, that was 10 years ago, roughly, or just over. Uh, and I remember asking them, okay, guys, um, so what have you done for us? And they thought about it a while, and they said, we invented the World Wide Web. And I said, come on, you've got to do better than that. <laughs> you know, all this equipment, and you invented the World Wide Web. So they were a bit stuck. And then I said, look, you're, you're looking for the Higgs boson, because it was on the agenda at the time, obviously. What if you don't find it? But we will. No, I've asked you, what if you don't identify it? But we will. So let's try again. Um, this is not Jeremy Paxman now doing it 14 times, but it was a bit like this. Okay, please, I'm asking you to uh, postulate, to hypothesize, what if you don't find it? What happens then? We will. Well, <laughs> apparently they did. It just took another 11 years roughly since, since then. Big thanks to Sarah Tagami and to Frank Close for being with us. Thanks to the speakers on the previous evenings as well. And a big thanks to the Alchemist Cafe team in working uh, behind the scenes mostly. Kate, Judith, Belinda, Killian, and I'm sure there are others. Shane, but uh, Jane or Shane? Okay, Jane and Shane and any, any variations on that that you like. Uh, We've had a little bit of a struggle with the venue, but I hope it's worked out uh, nonetheless. Uh, and again, thank you, and thank you to Sabine and to Claire, who uh, moderated on earlier evenings. Uh, and thank you all for being here. And now enjoy the food.